Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, in this video I want to talk about five simple steps you can take to improve your wildlife photography. So um, it's not rocket science, but simple things that we can do uh, prior to going out and taking uh, photographs uh, and then during taking photographs that will improve our hit rate and uh, generally improve our photography, uh, our wildlife photography. So the first one, and it's, it seems really obvious, but the amount of people I teach that don't know their way around their equipment, I mean that's one of the reasons they're there um, to learn from me obviously, but uh, it seems to me it's really really important uh, to know your way around uh, the camera, around the lens that you're using, so that when that fast moving action happens you haven't got to fumble around. So know where your uh, exposure compensation button is, uh, know where um, the aperture settings are, know how to change your shutter speed quickly, um, be very quick uh, when it comes to uh, changing the, uh, your ISO, unless you're on auto ISO. Um, think about the, the, the settings you need uh, to give you your best hit rate, and we'll come along uh, to that in, um, I think it's uh, tip number three, when it comes to camera settings. But the first tip is, is to spend a lot of time, before you even go out with, uh, to take photographs of wildlife, learning the layout of your camera. So learn where all the buttons are, learn where the menus are, set up um, the quick menus so that you can move in and out of those settings very quickly because when a little piece of wildlife action happens it happens so quickly you haven't got time to to faff around or mess around with the camera settings it's, you've got to know where those buttons are so it might be even worth closing your eyes and finding where those buttons are by touch without you know actually looking at the camera at the time and you can do that in your front room at home whilst listening to the radio or, or a record or something so learn the layout of your camera the layout of your lens so when you're uh, confronted with a really quick piece of uh, moving action uh, you don't have to mess around uh, trying to work out and look at the camera and work out where the buttons are you should be able to get to those buttons and change them without taking your eye away from the viewfinder this was probably one of the best wildlife experiences I've ever had. I was on a top of a mountain in the Cangorms uh, National Park in Scotland, uh, photographing uh, a mountain hare in the snow. And uh, the hare just put its head up and um, looked. I was with two friends and we were in, laying down in the snow, so not moving, didn't disturb the hare whatsoever. But it just looked up and then suddenly it just ran at the cameras. And... Um, I had a split second to react, so I needed to, again, as I mentioned earlier, I know all the settings on my camera, so I didn't have a chance to, to change anything. Uh, if I'd have spent a lot of time sort of faffing around, looking at the buttons and and uh, deciding what I wanted to do, there was no way I would have captured this moment. The hair literally ran towards us, and just at the last minute, it veered away and then ran up um, the rest of the mountainside. So the fact of the matter is, when you get a photo opportunity like this, it might only come once in a lifetime. So you need to be ready, you need to know all your camera settings so that you're not faffing around and you don't miss a shot. If it's a con common animal, then you're going to get a chance to photograph that animal again, or if it's a common event. But this is one of those times when I probably won't have a hare, a mountain hare, in the snow running at the camera like this. So I needed to be able to capture it and get uh, get sharp pictures. And I got five or six sharp pictures of the hair running towards me. And, and it was, as I say, a fantastic experience. So the second thing I would suggest is really, really important is, is obviously having a really good understanding of basic um, camera techniques. Um, so, and not just basic camera techniques, but those techniques that relate to fast moving wildlife action. So we need to know what sort of shutter speed uh, is required to freeze the motion of a partic the particular animal we're photographing. So for example, if we were pho photographing a heron in flight, we might need a thousandth of a second. If we're panning uh, with that animal and we've got good panning technique, we could possibly do it with a five hundredth of a second. If we're photographing woodland birds taking off, we might need 3,200 for the second. And it's really frustrating if you get a great shot, a really good piece of action, and the shutter speed was just too slow. So I would suggest that what you, know, what you need to do is to spend pl plenty of time practicing, obviously, but doing a little bit of research on the animals that you're photographing. And again, we'll come on to that uh, later on in this video. So we need to know what shutter speed uh, we need to freeze uh, the action that we're trying to capture. Uh, we need to have an understanding of depth of field. Now, if you're doing a single animal and you focus on the eye, 
then um, it doesn't really matter if the depth of field is quite shallow and it will be using a long lens anyway but if we're doing a group of animals we might need to use a bigger f number so that that depth of field is just increased as much as possible uh, and as I say using long focal lengths that is difficult um, we need to know really you know what is the highest ISO number that our camera can uh, shoot at without the noise becoming unacceptable and obviously we can use uh, denoising software such as Topaz now but there comes a point where that image is going to be um, not really uh, good enough quality uh, so that's all of these um, things are really really important we need to understand how to read the exposure histogram so that we can uh, check the exposure make sure we don't overexpose parts of our subject or underexpose parts of our subject especially when you've got white birds like uh, little egrets it's really really important not to overexpose the white areas of that bird so we need to have a sound uh, uh, understanding of exposure a sound understanding of action of uh, speed shutter speeds required to freeze that action a sound understanding of um, depth of field uh, and there are more there's many things that control depth of field not just the aperture on the camera so it's about having that basic understanding so that we can pick the right camera settings uh, for that right picture taking opportunity and they won't always be the same that's the thing as I say if you're doing a slow moving bird you don't need as fast a shutter speed as if you're doing a really fast moving bird now if we take uh, this to its natural conclusion the point of knowing this is you could argue um, all right, I'll just shoot with a fast shutter speed all the time and that way I can get the slow moving bird and I can get the fast moving bird but the fact of the matter is if we shoot with a slower shutter speed when it's feasible then our ISO will be lower and our picture will be less grainy so it's about knowing these the technical aspects of photography and uh, how it relates to uh, action in particular a uh, wildlife action as already mentioned the speed your subjects traveling at is going to have a major impact on the shutter speed you need to freeze the motion it's not the only uh, thing we need to think about but it's one of the most important things and if you look at this heron uh, it's not traveling too fast so i've managed to freeze the motion with a, a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second now if we move on to the long-tailed tit here uh, flapping its wings these small woodland birds are so quick and I photographed this at 1 uh, to 3,200th of a second and if you look the wingtips are still blurred because those wings are moving so quickly so we really need to take into account um, the speed of not only our subjects moving but how quickly they're flapping their wings and to be honest as long as the head and the eyes are sharp I don't really mind if there's a little bit of blur in the wings I think it adds um, a little bit of energy to the shot now if we look at the blue tick that was shot at 1 4 thousandth of a second 1 4 thousandth and uh, that's pretty much frozen all the movement and then the last uh, picture in this sequence um, is a great spotted woodpecker and uh, I photographed that at 1 6 thousand four hundredth of a second so that's a really fast shutter speed so these smaller birds especially when they're taking off they are super quick and you need a, a surprisingly fast shutter speed so uh, I think the next thing to uh, move on to is depth of field and um, if we look at this picture of the uh, nut hatch that was uh, shot at an aperture of f4 uh, using a 600 millimeter prime lens and you can see the background is really really soft and the nut, nut hatch stands out from the background so that's a really nice way to uh, photograph wildlife because you get that separation the wildlife is separated from the background because the background is lovely and soft and uh, that's what that small f number will give us uh, again there are other factors that uh, affect depth of field but you know we this is um, a, a video with basically five tips on uh, wildlife photography so I can't delve too deeply uh, so in this case so that really shallow depth of field works well now if we look at the next picture of um, a cup of a red of the red deer uh, a mum and, uh, and it's a baby I needed to shoot at a bigger f number because I've got more than one subject now so I need to create a bigger depth of field so the uh, the female deer in the foreground is sharp and then the baby in the background is also sharp so we've got these multiple subjects and we want to try and keep them both in reasonable focus or reasonably sharp focus and in order to get that I'm having to shoot with a, a much bigger f number um, and then I want to move on and quickly talk about exposure so as I mentioned white birds are particularly tricky when it comes to exposure we don't want to overexpose any of the white plumage um, it's super tricky when you've got um, a bird that's both black and white it's a, it's a bit of a compromise then but in the case of these two egrets I've got white birds against a really dark background the background was in shadow 
So the most important thing is to get the exposure correct for your subject or the most important part of the subject. So quite clearly with this picture, the most important thing are the two egrets. So I get the exposure right for the egrets and even if the background becomes underexposed, which it does here, I don't really care about that because it's the main subject that's the most important thing. And the fact that the background is, is underexposed now isn't a problem because again, I think it simplifies the background, you know, the, the fact that it's gone quite black like this and it makes those two white egrets, little egrets, stand out from the background. And then last but not least, we've got this picture of a kingfisher and this was shot at ISO 3200 on an older digital camera that I used to use. And uh, if you look close, you can see there's a fair bit of noise there. But the fact of the matter is, I'm still going to, if I have to pick, I'm going to pick having a picture that's got noise because I can reduce some of that noise uh, using um, post-production software rather than one that's got too slow a shutter speed and a blurred subject. So, you know, the whole point of this image is to capture that kingfisher taking off uh, and the last thing we want is the kingfisher to be blurred because the shutter speed was too slow. So in this case, I'm going to use a high ISO number and just disregard the fact that there's some extra digital noise. So the third thing on the list is practice. You cannot get enough practice when it comes to wildlife photography. The more you're out in the field, uh, honing your focusing skills and your camera techniques and your reactions, the better your photography is going to be, your wildlife photography. Now I would suggest it's no point in going and looking for rare animals to start with because you can spend hours waiting for that animal to turn up and you're getting no practice in at, at that, you know, during that time. So it'd be better to go down to a local lake and uh, photograph ducks or go to the coast and photograph gulls. Go somewhere where there's loads of animals and they can be common, that doesn't matter. And practice and hone your focusing skills and your camera technique finding your way around the camera and using the right shutter speeds and checking your exposures. So the third tip on this uh, list of five tips for better wildlife photography is to go out and practice. And I would suggest you go out and practice using common animals so that you don't have to spend a long time waiting for a subject to turn up. My fourth tip on the list is patience. You need to be really, really patient uh, to be a wildlife photographer. You know, we, once we've uh, practiced on the common subjects, in order to get really great wildlife pictures where we're showing behavior or action, you have to wait a long time and you have to be really patient. And it may be that you're sitting in a hide like this for hours on end. It might be that you're laying in a ditch for a long time waiting for a hare to, to pop up. It might be that you're in a, um, a little pop-up hide that you've brought yourself. But the fact of the matter is, Patience is a key, key element for wildlife photography. You can't expect to turn up, do an hour's photography and come back with something really special. Now, occasionally you do get lucky and, you know, that's brilliant when that happens. But generally, you, you have to put a lot of time in and uh, a lot of field craft and a lot of field work. Um, and that brings me on actually to field craft. So patience and field craft are key elements of being a wildlife photographer. Um, you need to be able to approach the animals quietly, um, don't break the horizon, so stay down low, uh, don't, obviously don't make a noise, um, and um, don't wear you know, any sort of um, aftershaves and stuff like that, and always approach uh, downwind so that your scent is blown away from you, so the animals, especially deer or something like that, don't know you're there. The key thing about being a wildlife photographer is that you don't change the behaviour of the animal, and uh, I think that's really important to be honest. Um, the welfare of the animal has got to always come first, hasn't it? It's, it's not worth stressing an animal, it's not worth changing the behaviour of that animal, stopping it feeding, uh, scaring it off and making it use uh, up energy that it didn't need to use. So the key thing is, uh, have good field crafts so A, you can get some great wildlife pictures, but B, you don't change or alter the behaviour of the animal and uh, you don't cause them any stress. Uh, so that will be definitely number four, patience, field craft. As I say, uh, patience is one of those major requirements if you want to be a wildlife photographer. And if you look at uh, the pictures of uh, this great crested grebe, I had a, a mat out on the side of a lake with a, um, a camouflage uh, cloth over me. So I was laying down on the riverbank and I laid in the same position for about five hours just waiting for this grebe to come in close. And it was an absolute bonus that um, the grebe had caught a fish as it came swimming past. But they are very nervous animals because they got hunted really extensively during Victorian times. Uh, so it means that you, unless you're in sort of maybe one of the London parks where the animals are there are a little bit more used to people, 
Uh, but if you're in a normal lake outside outside of London, uh, great crested grebes can be really, really, really nervous. So as I say, it took great patience for me to get these pictures. I was laying down on my chest for about five hours. I felt really, really achy. My neck was aching at the end, but the fact of the matter is I got the pictures, so it was worth having that patience to get those. And then if you look at these next images of um, a short-eared owl, it took patience of a different kind, really. So I wasn't waiting for hours and hours uh, and hours on end, but I did have to make multiple visits back to the same location to get these pictures. So uh, again, patience and uh, persistence were really, really important. So tip number five, the last thing um, I think um, is really important if you want to get cracking wildlife pictures, and that's knowing about the behaviour of the animal you're photographing. So it's a bit like field craft, but with field craft it's about how to approach that animal and uh, not cause it any stress. Um, knowing about the behaviour of the animal I think helps you get to the places you want to be when the animals are going to be there. So for example, if I'm going to f uh, photograph or look for field fairs, I'm going to be looking for um, uh, bushes with lots of uh, berries on, you know, the red and orange berries uh, and the slow berries, which are the black ones. And if I find that food source at the right time of year, which will be in the uh, late autumn winter months, then I've got a very good chance of spotting field fairs, red wings and, uh, and some thrushes. If I um, go to the Thames Estuary, where, where I live in Essex, in October, I've got a really great chance, and almost 100% guaranteed chance of photographing uh, Brent geese, which are fantastic geese that uh, migrate in in October from Siberia. So the more we know about the animal we're photographing, uh, the better our chance is going to be uh, to A, find the animal, and B, get some great photographs. And then little things like, you know, when a water bird has a bath, as shortly after it's going to flap its wings. So it's not rocket science again, but it gives you a great chance to be ready so you can anticipate the action. And I think that's a key thing with wildlife photography. We're not quick enough often to react to what that animal's doing. We have to know the behaviour of the animal uh, to, able, to be able to anticipate what it might do. And that's a really key skill. It means you get more action shots because you can anticipate the action. So knowing um, the behaviour and the biology the feeding habits, the migration patterns, if it's a migratory bird, uh, will really massively increase your chance of getting great wildlife shots. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, if you have enjoyed it and you haven't already uh, subscribed to my channel, if you can consider subscribing that would be great. The more the merrier, I'm slowly building the channel and I'm going to be bringing more content like this, um, location videos, equipment videos for wildlife photography. Um, so yeah, more the merrier really. If you have enjoyed the video also, you can give it a like, a thumbs up, that always helps my channel. Oh and if you do subscribe, if you can press the little bell icon, hopefully you'll be notified when my next video is uploaded so yeah i hope this has been uh, useful for you guys uh, thanks for watching uh, and i'll speak to you on my next video so bye for now